So uh, we're going to do three quick cases, and then we'll try to get back a little bit some of the time that we're behind. So for case number one, I need a volunteer. Come on up. You can come or I can pick. Okay, apparently I'm going to pick. Uh, sit in, I like the back row over there, second to the end. What's your name? Shane. Shane, come on down. All right, so this case is a 59-year-old uh, woman with mechanical low back pain, and she has a lot of left leg pain. Uh, pain is primarily on the L5 distribution, and uh, she has failed multiple measures like epidural steroid injections, facet blocks, doesn't have any medical history. Uh, she shows up in, in your clinic, Shane. And where are you from, Shane? Uh, from UT Houston. From Houston, okay. So she shows, shows up in your clinic in Houston, and uh, she has this kind of complaint. Um, what are you gonna do? Um, Just to move this along a little bit, she has some imaging. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if she comes in with these, these uh, plain films, she has um, almost no, uh, or a very small uh, level of uh, lumbar load dosage. So she's got some uh, collapsed discs, spread normal degenerative stuff, um, L5, uh, S1. So this is a dynamic flexion extension x-ray okay, so that her physiatrist got. Extension uh, here. So she's got a small uh, spondy as well um, at L5S1. Uh, it's, it's here present uh, in, in flexion that increases uh, slightly. So she's got a 5-1 spondy. Who grades spondies? If you were going to grade this, you would grade it as a... Uh, and whose grading system is that, out of curiosity? Myrding. Okay, so it's a Myerding grade one. Uh, spondylolisthesis can have subtypes. The couple most common ones are? Um, isthmic and degenerative. Okay, which one is this? Um, she has an isthmic spondylolisthesis. Okay, what does isthmic mean? Um, it, uh, the isthmus, of the, it's a, a pars defect. She's got a pars fracture, very good, excellent. All right, so she's got also this MRI that her outside doc gave to her. The mid lumbar discs look okay. That bottom disc is really quite collapsed and slipped, as you said, it's a grade one spondylolisthesis there. Uh, you can see the axial, a little bit of left-sided uh, disc bulging there, probably responsible for her radiculopathy. So um, uh, anything else you want to uh, see besides this? Um, I don't, it looks like she may have a little So you want more imaging? Um, I would get, um, she it didn't look like she had any surgery before. Correct? She's never had surgery, no. So I would just get. She's sent for, she's like a routine degenerative patient they sent to you for. I would for, just get uh, 36 inch. Oh, you would get 36 inch. So she didn't have those before. She got a CT scan as well from her CT guided injection of her, of her PARS. But as you pointed out, she's got the PARS fracture there and you wanted 36 inch long cassettes. So here's her 36 inch long cassettes. Is this the same patient? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it is the same patient. I wouldn't have expected that uh, if we weren't in this course, but uh, so she's got, um, she looks like she's probably in pretty decent uh, formal alignment overall. Yeah, she's a little bit of shoulder asymmetry on the right, just a little bit. Um, and then her sagittal balance is, Probably a little bit uh, positive here, but probably five, five centimeter range. Which is re reasonable, though, huh? Yeah. But so, not bad. what, what, uh, so, um, what are we going to do? Um, if she's got, you know, pure L5 radiculopathy, I think that needs to be addressed. But to me, uh, you know, the bigger issue, I'm sorry, how old is she again? Uh, she's 50 ish something. Uh, 50 yeah, something. So, uh, um, I'm not, you know, if she's asymptomatic from this, she's not having a lot of back pain. She's not, just at the very bottom. Uh, yeah, then I, I think it might be reasonable to address the, the one level right now, but this has got to be uh, followed over time, and I think if she uh, progresses, uh, it's hard to tell what, or, or for me to tell what the, uh, the line is, but I think it's, give those measurements. Okay. So um, her lumbar lordosis is within 10 degrees of her pelvic incidence. Her SVA is normal, as you described. Her chronal and sagittal balance are really quite good. Um, so um, so 
so I think if we um, if we just do uh, one, one level on her, she's going to continue uh, out to progress in her curve. So these are these are choices. These are potential choices. Yeah. Okay. Where are we going? Uh, yeah. Which ones would you not do? Let's yeah, eliminate what you wouldn't do. So uh, she doesn't. Um, I wouldn't do just a, a straight posterior fusion. For okay. Okay, uh, why not? Because I think you can help uh, increase her foraminal diameter um, and decompress her with in the body fusion at, at five one. And so, okay. Um, something like an A lift or a, a plif, whatever, whatever you want to do is uh, better. Um, you can help get greater low doses with an A lift uh, as well. Um, so, I think I would start small. Okay. With you, but I think that there's a pretty good chance that she'll progress over time. Okay. I think that's, you, you, you had a lot of very good ideas there, and um, that's excellent. You can have a seat. I'll take that back. Um, so these are the kinds of things where Justin said, what, what do you think about when the patient comes to your clinic? So these are the kinds of questions that uh, when a patient comes to my clinic, sometimes rarely there's a resident in my clinic, but it does happen once in a blue moon. Often there's a fellow in my clinic. Uh, I usually say, what is the SBA? I want to know what is the LLPI mismatch. If they have radiculopathy, I want to know where is the stenosis. I want to know if there's dynamic instability. If there's a coronal Cobb angle, I want that measured. What are the endpoints? And then I ask myself, do I need to cross the TL or LS junction? I think if I ask myself these questions, these five questions, one, two, three, five, six questions, I can usually get most of the data that I need to make a treatment decision. So let's just think about this on this particular case. Patient's SBA is normal, so I don't really need to make a sagittal parameter correction here. The LPI mismatch is really quite good. It's less than 10 degrees. So again, I don't need to make a lot of correction there either. What are the levels of stenosis? It's only 5-1. Where is their dynamic instability? Again, it's only 5-1. She's got a balanced double major curve. Now, she does have a bit of a lateral ascesis at L3. It's not today's problem. That could be a problem that will affect her later. But it's not today's problem. So the question is, do I need to cross the TL or LS junction, or can I limit myself to L5-S1? This is the choice that I gave to the patient. Do we want to do this curve only because there's a little bit of a lateral asthesis here, though she's not symptomatic from it today. Or do we want to focus here, which is really her symptom? So I talked to her about that, because we could potentially also fix this. And there is some degenerative arthritis there with lateral asthesis. Lateral asthesis of more than six millimeters is an indicator that this is likely to progress some point in the future. So that's something to watch out for. But overall, her parameters are not bad. And so this is one where, even though this god-awful thing is there, it's not really the major issue. The major issue is here. So I just did an L5-S1 for her. And you know, basically, just like you said, I did an ALIF. Uh, you know, this is the ALIF setup. Uh, started small. I wanted to get some indirect foraminal opening. So we got a little bit bigger, put in a graft. And because she has an isthmic spinal anesthesis, I also wanted to fixate from the back, too, because I don't trust this construct. Because the dorsal elements are not intact. So I did put in screws from the back as well. Um, she actually did really well from this. I'm still following her, watching that L3-4 listhesis, that's the lateral listhesis. Hasn't been a problem yet, but it probably is gonna be a problem eventually, I'm guessing. Um, but this is the kind of thing that I thought about when I did this case. So this is where she ended up. So I need a new volunteer for the next case. And uh, let's see over here in the green shirt. What's your name? Winston. Winston? Oh, are you from UVA? Yes. Ah. Here you go. All right. So, 67 year old woman with low back pain and bilateral sciatica and anterior thigh pain. And also failed multiple epidural steroids. This patient is on oral narcotics. Um, and then just to move this along a little bit, she comes in with these x-rays. So, so what do you see? So the C, uh, the C7 pulmonary looks like it's in pretty good position. This looks like he has a flat back, so we'll look, look, look at the pelvic um, uh, incidence of uh, lumbar lordosis mismatch. Um, there is an, a fake coronal imbalance. Um, and there is, looks like a 
grade one, five S one, that was one of the thesis on flexion. Okay. And this is the MRI. And the axials uh, with the stenosis were three, four, and four, five. So it looks like there's a central zone as well as for amino stenosis at both levels. Worse on the left side than there. Actually, pretty similar levels. I guess worse on the left one than three, four, and similar on that whole time. Mm -hmm. So, what are we going to do with this person? So, I can tell you the, the SVA here is about maybe six centimeters ish. Um, the LLPI mismatch is about 25 degrees. I measured all that. I won't make you measure it all because Justin wants me to move this along. So you probably want to correct 10 degrees, oh, probably 10 more degrees of more doses um, to correct the mismatch. Maybe 15. Um, so probably be able to get away with even uh, two level two of the four since the, since, uh, since uh, there's two there as well, so you can probably do a three to S1 fusion with two level two Okay. Not unreasonable. You would do it open, you would do it MIS. What are we going to do with the two three disc looks pretty collapsed too, we just, that's okay. Probably would do it open. Are we leaving two three alone? There's no stenosis there. Okay. Is it okay to stop a multi-level fusion when at the when the disc immediately adjacent is already degenerated? Is that okay? Not okay? What do you think of that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, basically, this is how I thought about this case, um, and I think uh, who gave the chronal talk this morning? Was it Dan? Uh, Dan gave the chronal talk this morning. I think he showed something similar. But basically, we want to know what are the Cobb and Cobb vertebrae of this curve. And so for this curve, um, you know, these are the questions again. And let's see where it takes us. So SVA was under 5. The LPI mismatch is about 25 degrees. The stenotic levels are 3 to 5. Uh, there's no real dynamic instability. There is that, a bit of a 5-1 slip, but it's fixed there. The chronal Cobb angle is 2 to 5. And all of those levels are generated. Actually, 2 to S1 was degenerated. So when I ask myself, do I need to cross the TL junction, I don't think so. Chronal Cobb doesn't extend up there. L2 is not an unreasonable stopping point. I do think I need to cross the lumbosacral junction, because that disc is already degenerated and slipped a bit. I don't want to park a couple level fusion on top of that. Uh, and so I did want to do that. But this is one that you could consider doing MIS. Now, why is that? Uh, as we went about earlier today, the SVA is under 6. The pelvic tilt is less than 25. The LLPI mismatch is under 30. So you're in a class 2 situation here. So you could do this MIS. Certainly is a feasible way to think about doing this. So I did laterals at L2 to 5. And then I did a TLF at 5.1 MIS with screws. So that's ended up where we are with the T lift down at the bottom, the percutaneous screws up at the top, and we slid in the rod, and so she ends up here. So you can see, you can get quite a bit of correction from that lateral. Um, very good chronal correction for sure. Now the question is sagittal correction, right? The chronal doesn't really count. Sagittally, she didn't need a lot though. Um, she did need about, you know, 15 degrees. So, but I got some sagittal correction out of it too. I put my cages towards the front and I squeezed down on the back. Uh, so sagittally she ended up okay too. But this is one where you could consider MIS. That first one I kind of did a pseudo MIS thing, open a lift and then small thing on the back. That's, that's very good. Okay, I think I'll, I'll show you this and then we'll stop. So basically a partial facet resection and this is going in the new MOC book that I'm helping Chris Shaffrey with. But um, partial facet resection will give you five degrees. A full facet removal, which you might call Smith-Peterson, but other people might call Ponte osteotomy. That'll give you 10 degrees. Uh, PSO, which is going to be a grade three. 
We'll give you about 30 degrees. And in a PSO, you want that bone to kiss, because that bone doesn't kiss, then you won't get your fusion mass. And then if you want more than 30 degrees, you can do a grade four, where you do the PSO, but you also take the cranial disc. And then you can put a cage in there and pivot a bit on the cage, and you'll get a lot of correction. Maybe 35, 40 degrees. And there's also five and six switches of ECR, but, and multiple VCRs, but with that, I'll digress there. So I'll stop there, ask if there's any questions, and we can go on to the next speaker.